It's pretty wild that in the span of 16 years, there's been four different versions of Spider-Man on the big screen. Let's hurry up and get on with this feud before the fifth one takes shape. Tobey Maguire was the first to don the suit in the theater, but does that make him the best? Yes. Yes, it does. According to some. I think he did a great job, but I'm also fond of pretty much every incarnation so far. Toby's a very likable, down-on-his-luck Peter that spoke to a lot of moviegoers. His Spider-Man looked fantastic, too, in a suit some still consider to be the greatest. Andrew Garfield was less believable as a Peter Parker for me because I didn't buy him as a loser. And frankly, it's because his hair was beautiful. He had a luscious mane growing on the top of his head that I dare anyone to hate. You don't make enemies with hair like that. He did quip and joke around as the web crawler, which was a big step up for those that missed that from Raimi's interpretation. Tom Holland was the first high schooler who actually looked the age, probably because he wasn't pushing 30 like the previous two. Tom knocks it out of the park as both a sympathetic Peter Parker and a sillier Spider-Man. Into the Spider-Verse is not content on giving us one Spider-Man. No, they give us a potpourri of options, with the main two focuses being on a burnt-out, heartbroken Peter Parker and the newcomer Miles Morales. He's the son of a cop who can't decide which side of the tracks he wants to be on, often preferring to hang out with his cool uncle over his own father. Jake Johnson's Parker along with Miles have truly compelling stories that both manage to end in satisfying ways. Eventually, more crazy versions of characters pop up, such as Spider-Gwen, Spider-Ham, Spider-Man Noir, and Penny Parker. A heavy set of new characters can be tough for one movie to juggle. Spider-Verse does it with such ease, you would think this was the third or fourth film in the series. The first two entries spend a solid amount of time focusing on Peter's love interests, MJ and Gwen Stacy, played by Kirsten Dunst and Emma Stone. Director Raimi treats this in an almost soap opera-ish way, whereas Mark Webb tries to convey the awkward interactions of high school love. And in this regard, I think both pale in comparison to Spider-Man Homecoming and Into the Spider-Verse. And you can take my word for it, as I have my finger on the pulse of what teenagers like these days. Flossing. Fortnite. We have different friends, Aunt Mays, father figures, and so on to help separate these four pictures. One big win from the Raimi version is of course J.K. Simmons as J. Jonah Jameson. A character so perfect, the other three movies didn't even bother topping it. Unless you count the Into the Spider-Verse end credits, which I don't, that's cheating. A Spider-Man movie is nothing without a good adversary to take down. Willem Dafoe goes full-blown Power Rangers villain in the first outing. The suit is cheap and silly looking, like my Hatchimal collection, yet I can't help but enjoy the craziness the Sam Raimi world brings. I wish I could say the same about Amazing Spider-Man's antagonist, Dr. Kurt Connors, aka The Lizard. He felt underdeveloped, also like my Hatchimal collection. On a positive side of things, he felt threatening, like a real danger to Spider-Man. Homecoming's villain also happens to still be the best Batman, you heard me. And there's a few smaller characters like Shocker thrown in for good measure. Who doesn't love a good Shocker, right ladies and guys? Keaton's character Vulture gets a great backstory early on, providing the audience with a real motivation for his actions. Into the Spider-Verse has a lot of villains to counter our heroes. Characters like Dr. Octopus, Scorpion, and so on are present, but never outshadow the main foe, Kingpin. Much like Homecoming, he's driven by something more compelling. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in round two. Coming up now... Spider-Man swung into the theaters in 2002, it was unlike anything an audience has ever seen before. The sheer scope and production of Raimi's picture was on another level. In full disclosure, I'm not a Spider-Man comic book reader, so if you base your movie preference on which one's closest to the source material, I mean, that's not what this is. From what I could gather, though, 2002 gets a lot of the essentials right. An origin story of a socially awkward teen getting bit by a radioactive spider, which gives him super strength, spider sense, and in this film's case, organic webbing. Then you have those touchstone moments like Uncle Ben's death, treated with a lot of respect. The revenge angle spinning into a savior for the city made sense. The film was obviously a rousing success, and two more were made in the franchise. Amazing Spider-Man wasn't as fortunate, only getting a two-movie run. I'm not going to knock the flick, I've done it in the past, I'm just going to say this one's not for me. Mark Webb showcased a bit darker angle of the web slinger in terms of style. Much like Batman, the action segments mostly took place at night. Andrew Garfield would lighten some of these moments up with a joke or two, but the picture felt more somber all around. It also felt very familiar story-wise, and we retread a lot of those same beats. Homecoming opted to bypass it altogether. 
Civil War introduced us to our new Peter Parker with a small amount of backstory. This allowed Homecoming to jump right into the good stuff. That said, I wouldn't have minded a bit more connection with this version of the character, even if it's just told through like a two or three minute flashback scene or him visiting Uncle Ben's grave. Just something to really understand and get in his mindset, why he wants to be a hero, why he's out there fighting every day. Since this is the first Sony Marvel hybrid, we get to see some Avengers here and there. Tony Stark plays mentor dad as Peter attempts to keep the streets clean. This becomes a problem when he gets a bit in over his head and has to fight the vulture one on one, save Tony Stark's invisible plane from being hijacked. Miles has his own set of obstacles to overcome, mainly keeping his father from finding out he's the new vigilante in town taking the mantle from the previously beloved Spider-Man. It's basically the plot of the Santa Claus, except for good. I'm joking, Tim Allen is a national treasure. Miles learns the Kingpin has found a way to peek into the multiverse. The Kingpin also learns something too. With great power comes great responsibility. His science experiment has consequences. The worlds collide, Power Man 5000 style, bringing in all sorts of wacky new stuff. Different flavors of both villains and superheroes. Now our ragtag group must band together to stop the Kingpin and return each member home. I'm always amazed when a seemingly complicated story can be told so easily. Here's the deal, I don't hate any of these four movies. And I think it's anybody's game, really. Outside of The Amazing Spider-Man. I asked the Patreon and YouTube community which they preferred. They had thoughts. Here's a few of them now. Supporter Jason Thomas says, It has to be Homecoming. One of the best on-screen Spider-Man portrayals and Michael Keaton. What more do you need? Please note, I have not yet seen Spider-Verse, so I cannot judge it. No, you can't! Your opinion is invalid! Thank you for supporting the channel, Jason. Yakov Kropostman picked the first Spider-Man for inspirational reasons, stating it came out at a time that I was bullied at school and I was in a deep depression. That movie gave me hope and made me smile for the first time in months. Hey, bud, you'll always have a friend in me person's name I had a hard time pronouncing. Honestly though, movies are awesome, aren't they? Liam Mackey goes with Into the Spider-Verse. Raimi's Spider-Man 2 is still the best Spider-Man movie ever, with Homecoming being my least favorite, feeling to me like it was directed by a conveyor belt. Ouch! And he didn't even mention Amazing Spider-Man, so I'm not sure which is worse in that scenario. Over in the YouTube community, we have the Republic of Bridger saying, Into the Spider-Verse is great, I love it, I think it's great, but Homecoming is better. Wow, I did not see that twist coming. That's like M. Night Shyamalan's latest when he said that glass was going to be great. Lastly, we have Alexander McCarty picking old reliable Spider-Man. The best superhero origin movie, only rivaled by Iron Man, but since that one has a weak villain, Spider-Man wins out. Let these movies be a lesson to those stating you can't tell the same movie four times four different ways. I'm not sure anybody's ever said that in their life ever, but let that be a lesson regardless. We have four very different looking films. Sam Raimi's world is colorful, vibrant, full of zany characters, and the action is well framed with wonderfully fluid camera work that moves around the city with ease. Danny Elfman's theme song is in a league of its own, adding to the pageantry that is Spider-Man. The Amazing Spider-Man looks slick, highly polished, and has some of the best looking nighttime fights around. I can't however say the same about the music, which feels flat throughout the picture. There is no high flying web swinging, no dramatic slow motion American flag shots to be had, no Chad Kroger belting from the top of his lungs, a hero can save us. There is a fun creative intro shot via the smartphone of Peter as he's walking around his daily routine. That was nice, that was different and everything else feels pretty much kind of generic. The soundtrack's a mix of upbeat pop music blended with a spin on the original classic theme. The Into the Spider-Verse team spent a year trying to establish a look for the film and topped out at 142 animators to wrap it all up. So much to take in from the blending of art styles to the fact that they are being animated at different speeds. It's a love letter to comics in every sense of the word, from the explosive color palette to the way everything jumps off the screen. Daniel Pemberton gives Elfman a run for his money, this is me running with my fingers, providing a modern score that's synth heavy and has a soul to it all. The action is as frantic as the visuals, begging for multiple viewings. The wild shots of color and motion blur could turn off a few people if I need to find things to complain about here. That would, that would be it. Hey, I'm all in, I'm all in. This was not an easy decision for me to come to. There were multiple nights where I'd lie awake in bed wondering to myself why I still have a YouTube show. And on a rare instance, I thought about the feud as well. As much as I love and respect the Raimi original, Into the Spider-Verse is just perfect. And since my opinion isn't the only one that matters, even though it matters the most, I polled the YouTube community. 
Here's where we landed on things. In last, with an embarrassing amount of votes, is The Amazing Spider-Man with only 4%. In second to last is Homecoming with 25% of the take. In second place, I said this in a weird way. Get ready. Spider-Man. 31% of the vote, leaving the winner into the Spider-Verse with 40%. I never thought I'd see the day when I could say this, but we are in full agreement with this ranking. Thank you for watching. Feel free to join the Adam Does Movies community and take part in future episodes. After all, this is more than just reviews. This is Movie Feuds. And a new season is underway.